Hi everyone, um, I'm Neha, uh, I'm a second year nephrology fellow. Uh, my topic for today is lupus nephritis in pregnancy, uh, a delicate balancing act. Um, uh, am I able to advance? Okay. Uh, my objectives for today, um, to understand the relation between lupus nephritis and pregnancy, to highlight the importance of interdisciplinary care in managing lupus nephritis in pregnant patients, to counsel and prepare patients with lupus nephritis for pregnancy, to recognize the impact on pregnancy outcomes, to identify and uh, manage patients with lupus nephritis during pregnancy. Um, I'll try not go into the details uh, regarding the immunosuppression. I'll briefly outline uh, the drugs that we use uh, during pregnancy. What is normal renal function in pregnancy? This was a study published in 2019. Um, in this study of pregnant women, serum creatinine concentrations rapidly declined in the first trimester, reached a plateau in the second, um, and slowly increased in the third trimester towards the pre-pregnancy concentration. Glomerular hyperfiltration, it is a typical physiological adaptation to pregnancy reflected by a decrease in the levels of serum creatinine with advancing gestational age. Uh, typically, the GFR increases by 50 to 60%, with a subsequent increase in creatinine clearance of approximately 30%. What happens to the immune system in pregnancy? Pregnancy is characterized by hormonal modulation of both innate and adaptive immunity to establish maternal immune tolerance to a semi-allogenic fetus expressing both maternal and paternal antigens. During normal pregnancy, the number of CD4 and CD25 regulatory T cells is increased. These cells have a potent immunosuppressive actions and contribute to fetal tolerance. In addition, normal pregnancy is characterized by a shift from Th1 cell-mediated immunity to Th2 antibody-mediated immunity response, which is uh, Th2 polarization. This relative suppression of Th1 cell-mediated immunity Mediate, mediates some immune tolerance of the fetus. Um, however, these immunological changes may affect the incidence and severity of certain autoimmune diseases and pregnancy outcomes. In patients with lupus, they have fewer T regulatory cells that are also functionally defective, which may confer increased risk for preeclampsia and maternal and fetal morbidity. How to approach a patient with lupus nephritis in pregnancy? Let's talk through a let's let's talk through a case. Um, this was a 36-year-old female with class four five lupus nephritis who was diagnosed in March of 2022. She was treated with steroids, mycophenolate, hydroxychloroquine, and was started on losartan. Her labs from January of 2023 showed normal complements, stable double-stranded DNA titers, a stable urine protein creatinine ratio of 0.3, and stable renal function. Her SLA activity index was zero. During her course from March 2022 to January 2023, she was pretty stable without any lupus flares or any worsening, worsening of any titers. So she's planning for a pregnancy later this year. How would one approach? Pre-pregnancy evaluation is imperative for all women with lupus nephritis to stratify them into different risk profile groups, which includes inactive or stable lupus nephritis, active lupus nephritis, and lupus nephritis with severe impairment of organ function and a pre-existing severe organ damage. Um, so my patient, who had pretty stable lupus uh, for about a year, um, falls into the first category, category, which is inactive or stable lupus nephritis. So what is a preconception preparation in patients with lupus nephritis? The goal of the counseling should be to optimize her health before preg becoming pregnant. It is imperative for all women to be classified um, into different risk profile groups as discussed in the previous slide. An assessment of the baseline disease activity should be made using um, all the laboratory and histological parameters we have. Um, all women of childbearing age, um, with SLA should be counseled about fertility issues, especially uh, with the use of alkylating agent. If the patient is to receive an alkylating agent, um, then pr fertility preservation methods such as gonadotropin-releasing hormones should be considered. 
to prevent unwanted pregnancies, especially during active disease and those receiving teratogenic medications, women with lupus nephritis should be counseled regarding the contraception methods. Um, given the inherent risk of infertility, um, mainly menstrual irregularities and premature ovarian failure associated with cyclophosphamide, a mycophenolate acid analog based regimen is a preferred initial therapy uh, of proliferative lupus nephritis. Uh, the preconception counseling should also include uh, discussion of the risk of lupus flare, thromboembolic events, um, preeclampsia, preterm delivery um, regarding IOGR, um, uh, small for gestational age, and death. Um, I really like this visual abstract, which uses the go, wait, stop approach. Patients with inactive lupus nephritis. Uh, they fall into group one, they have the safest window to proceed with pregnancy planning. Patients with active lupus nephritis with uh, more than one gram of proteinuria, uh, who have higher markers of double-stranded DNA, low complements, they should be advised to avoid pregnancy for at least six months after the lupus nephritis is negative, inactive. Dealing pregnancy plans would ensure patients are well optimized for successful outcomes in future. The third category of lupus nephritis with concurrent severe damage should be counseled regarding the risks for disease progression that could lead to end organ failure and pregnancy related risks both to the mother and the baby. Women in this group should be discouraged from pursuing pregnancy um, and instead they should be encouraged to consider alternative options such as adoption and pregnancy. Uh, so what should I tell my patient who has stable disease? Um, it is recommended to continue hydroxychloroquine throughout pregnancy. Once it is determined that the patient's disease is stable for about at least uh, a few months, um, switch from mycophenolate to azothioprine pre-pregnancy and continue throughout pregnancy to maintain remission or low disease activity. Women were advised to conceive at the earliest after another three months after stopping the mycophenolate to ensure stabilization. Ideally, we would like to wait for six months to monitor for relapses after MMS, uh, after MMF is out of the system, which takes about three months. And the additional three months gives us the opportunity to monitor um, the patients on azathioprine and to monitor for any flares. MMF could either be uh, directly switched to azathioprine or it could be tapered in doses of 500 milligram per day into four weeks and slowly uh, monitor the disease uh, uh, re uh, response while on azathioprine. Um, some other things um, uh, that we counsel again, again uh, in pregnant women would be to uh, continue the azathioprine, um, stop the ACE inhibitor or ARB at the time of pregnancy, stop the statin at the, top, at the time of pregnancy, start low-dose aspirin to reduce the risk of preterm birth and preeclampsia. Uh, obviously, start prenatal vitamins that would be done preconception um, and uh, check for um, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome and consider anticoagulation with the positive result. Check for anti SSA and antibody, SSB antibody, and if positive, monitor closely for neonatal lupus syndrome. Um, EULA recommends closer monitoring and closer uh, fetal surveillance in patients who have positive anti SSA and anti SSB. Disease activity should be continuously monitored um, during all uh, prior to conception and throughout pregnancy using the available markers. Um, so what do I tell my patient who is asking me about what are the risks of developing preeclampsia or what are the maternal and fetal outcomes? Um, this was a study published by Jill Byron Grooms in a large prospective study in the United States and Canada that included about 385 women from multiple ethnic and racial backgrounds. It included patients with stable disease and excluded any patient with active lupus nephritis. Uh, they monitored adverse pregnancy outcomes, which included fetal or neonatal death, birth before 36 weeks due to placental insufficiency, hypertension, or preeclampsia and small for gestational age. Um, disease activity was assessed with uh, SLE preg uh, uh, pregnancy disease activity index and physicians global assessment. Adverse pregnancy outcomes occurred in 19%. Um, overall, 81% of 236 women had uncomplicated pregnancies. Fetal and infant deaths were rare. Severe maternal flares in the second and third trimesters occurred only in 2.5% and 3% respectively. 
And as ex expected, patients with positive anti anti-cardiolipin antibody had worse outcomes compared to patients with uh, lupus coagulase negative um, uh, patients. Um, this was another study published by Moroni et al. in 2016. Um, this was a pros prospective study of about 71 pregnancies with mostly inactive lupus nephritis. Flares of SLE occurred in almost 20% of patients. 8.4% of patients developed preeclampsia and 2.8% of the patients developed HELP syndrome. Low C3 and high anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies were predictive of kidney flares uh, and obesity was associated with worse outcomes. Preterm birth um, occurred in about 28.2% of the patients, a much higher rate than general population. Um, and the uh, number for small for gestational age uh, was 16% and fetal loss at 8%. Although these statistics um, might feel overwhelming to a patient, most women who become pregnant uh, with stable lupus nephritis or stable um, extra kidney uh, lupus, they have unremarkable pregnancies. Uh, while explaining this risk, it is important um, to also remember that with closed monitoring, patients in complete remission or partial remission with low disease activity can have favorable pregnancy outcomes. Um, this is another case um, that I recently saw uh, is a 30 year old female uh, primary gravida with history of lupus diagnosed in 2011 who is admitted um, with at 24 weeks gestational age with new onset edema, hypertension, nephrotic range proteinuria of 10 grams. In February of 2022, mycophenolate was stopped in anticipation of pregnancy and she was switched to azathioprine and continued on hydroxychloroquine. On admission, she was hypertensive with blood pressure ranging 140 over 160, uh, over 80 to 90. Um, during the time when MMF was stopped and switched to azathioprine, she had about four months when she got pregnant in uh, around July, and she did not have any disease activity or any flares. Um, she had a low um, stable complement levels, but uh, anti-double stranded DNA titers were um, normal as well. Her proteinuria was uh, less than uh, uh, less than one gram. Admission admission labs showed anemia with hemoglobin of nine to ten. Uh, she had low C three and C four, which was chronic since May of 2022. Elevated anti double stranded DNA from um, 17, which increased to 26 in January of 2023, and she had nephrotic range proteinuria of 8.8 .8 grams from 0.84 in December of 2022. Her platelets and liver function tests were normal. So how do you approach? Uh, do you think this is a flare of lupus nephritis or is it preeclampsia? Early in pregnancy, the presence of new or worsening proteinuria and hypertension uh, will almost always represent a flare of new lupus nephritis. However, beyond 24 to 26 weeks of gestation, differentiating a flare um, from preeclampsia poses a challenge both diagnostically and therapeutically. So what happens in uh, preeclampsia? Uh, patients with genetic factors, pre-existing risk factors such as chronic hypertension, diabetes, uh, antiphospholipid antibody, um, they, they fail the immunological and immunological factors. The trophoblasts fail to adapt to an uh, endothelial phenotype. This leads to impaired trophoblast invasion and incomplete spiral artery modeling, causing placental ischemia and increasing angiogenic markers such as soluble FMS like tyrosine kinase and soluble endoclin. The soluble tyrosine kinase binds to, um, binds to and decreases VEGF and placental growth factor, which are important mediators of endothelial cell function, um, especially in fenestrated endothelium, which is present in brain, liver, glomeruli, leading to endothelial dysfunction in maternal vasculature. These factors mediate downstream effects that create uh, a vasoconstrictive state oxidative stress and microemboli that contribute to the involvement of multiple organ systems and thus the clinical features of preeclampsia. This table highlights the differences between lupus flare and preeclampsia. Uh, lupus nephritis can present any time during pregnancy, whereas preeclampsia is likely to occur after 20 weeks. It can be difficult to differentiate between the two after 20 weeks of pregnancy. First pregnancy, history of preeclampsia, uh, Multi-fetal pregnancy can indicate preeclampsia. Um, hypertension after 20 weeks is more suggestive of preeclampsia. Uh, proteinuria, proteinuria might be present in both. Um, 
a lupus nephritis flare, however, can involve only the kidney or it can involve multiple organs. In preeclampsia, you sometimes can see development of thrombocytopenia, hemolysis, transaminitis, along with symptoms of headache, visual uh, symptoms, and seizures. Urine microscopy can be an important tool. In patients with lupus nephritis, uh, we see they, they might be having dysmorphic RBCs, um, um, which can suggest a lupus nephritis flare, as well as other increasing titers of anti-double-stranded DNA or low complements level. Uh, whereas in pregnancy, complement levels are usually normal or increasing in pregnancy. Um, um, novel angiogenic markers, um, as we discussed in the previous slide, uh, soluble tyrosine kinase like factor, soluble endoglin, and placental growth factor can be helpful in the differenti differential diagnosis. Um, uh, however, the sensitivities um, remain low and the data is very limited. Um, what, should, what, should, what should be the target blood pressure during pregnancy? This was published in April of 2022, which recommends utilizing uh, a blood pressure of 140 over 90 as a threshold for initiation or titration of medical therapy for chronic hypertension, uh, rather than previously recommended threshold of 160 over 110 in pregnancy. Is there a role for kidney biopsy? Uh, this was a systemic review from 2013 by Piccoli et al. The aim of the study was to systematically review the literature on kidney biopsy in pregnancy. In about 197 kidney biopsies performed during gestation, um, there were 2% major complication rates and 5% minor complication rates. Uh, major complications included bleeding, uh, including large perirenal hematomas requiring blood transfusions. Minor events included smaller hematomas, macrohematuria of several hours, and um, severe loin pain. In 269 biopsies performed postpartum, there were about 1% minor events and no serious adverse effects. Uh, based on the results, it was thought that the, uh, the results were kind of heterogeneous, um, Overall, the risk of complications were higher in pregnancy than in the postpartum period. Um, therefore, the, therefore, kidney biopsy should be uh, considered during pregnancy when therapeutic uh, decisions depend on a precise pathologic diagnosis. So going back to my patient, she was started on prednisone. Uh, prednisone. Her blood pressure was managed uh, with labetalol along with diuresis for shortness of breath. Her urine microscopy did not show any active sediment. It had no RBCs, no dysmorphic RBCs were seen. Uh, even on her UH, she did not have any hematuria. Given inactive urine sediment with ongoing symptoms of shortness of breath and hypertension, we did not pursue a kidney biopsy. And also, we did not think at that time that kidney biopsy would have changed her management. Uh, she was taken for an emergency C-section at 24 weeks due to worsening symptoms. Um, um, and post-delivery, her blood pressure improved. Uh, it went back to 120 systolics over 80s. And her proteinuria improved significantly from 15 grams to 1.5 grams. Uh, she was discharged from the hospital and she, and she was seen in the nephrology clinic when she underwent a biopsy that showed focal lupus nephritis and membranous lupus nephritis class 3, 5 with predominant features of chronicity without prominent inflammatory activity. Uh, uh, she was started on, uh, she continued the azathioprine postpartum and the uh, uh, and hydroxychloroquine, um, uh, but has not been started on any biologics uh, as she's still um, breastfeeding. Um, does it matter uh, if the patient has proliferative lupus nephritis to begin with versus uh, membranous? There were a couple of studies that I was able to uh, find, uh, mostly retrospective studies in about 41 pregnancies by Tanya Dahl in 2010 in women with proliferative lupus nephritis, and it was found that 56% of the pregnancies with lup proliferative uh, lupus resulted in live births with high rate of preterm birth and low birth weight. The study also found that women with higher levels of proteinuria and lower levels of complement were more likely to have pregnancy outcome. Another study of 63 pregnancies in women uh, with proliferative lupus nephritis, they were at higher risk for developing preeclampsia and renal insufficiency compared to those with membranous. Uh, there were no significant differences in the rates of fetal loss, preterm birth, neonatal complications between the two groups. Um, in, in, there were about two studies of, on membranous uh, lupus nephritis in pregnancy. Uh, in a study of about 30 pregnancies, it was found that 
Uh, those with membranous lupus nephritis had a lower rate of preeclampsia and renal insufficiency compared to those with proliferative lupus nephritis. Again, there were no significant differences in the rates of fetal loss or preterm birth between two groups. Uh, another la, fourth study of about 25 pregnancies of women with lupus nephritis, it was found that um, uh, in patients with membranous lupus, they had a higher rate of live births and lower rate of preterm births compared to those with proliferative lupus nephritis. Uh, these are some of the common uh, drugs that we use during pregnancy and lactation. Um, drugs compatible with pregnancy and breastfeeding include um, sulfasalazine and the immunosuppressive agents cyclosporin, azathioprine, and tacrolimus. Glucocorticoids can help manage flares, uh, but providers should use the lowest dose possible for disease control. Uh, NSAs are okay. Um, during early pregnancy, however, after 30 weeks, they can cause premature closure of ductus arteriosus and uh, should be discontinued. Uh, rituximab, uh, belimumab, and other biological agents can continue through conception, however, should be discontinued with a positive uh, pregnancy test. Um, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, mycophenolate, and in they are considered teratogenic, and they should be stopped prior to pregnancy and avoid, uh, and should be avoided in lactating women. Uh, what about rituximab in pregnancy? Um, there were a couple of studies, a systematic review and a case series, um, and also uh, uh, and a rituximab administration in third trimester of pregnancy, uh, uh, which showed that um, the use of rituximab during pregnancy, it's a complex issue and evidence is limited. Some studies showed that the drug may be associated with an increased risk of adverse pregnancy outcomes, such as preterm birth and low birth weight and neonatal infections. And other studies have reported favorable outcomes with no increased adverse events. However, uh, they did notice um, uh, suppress, suppression of the neonatal B cell development. Rituximab requires uh, about 110, uh, the eff effective elimination is about 110 days, although the B cell depletion might last longer. The IgG1 does not cross placenta until 16 weeks. Um, when during pregnancy, when given during pregnancy, uh, the depletion might be noted in new, newborns, but um, it, it recovers by six months. Um, how about cyclophosphamide in pregnancy? Um, the data that I have come across is usually during the first and the second trimesters. It is teratogenic and should be avoided. Um, there were a few studies uh, which might have which have seen results that cyclophosphamide has been used um, in the third trimester uh, without any adverse effects. So, in summary. Uh, lupus nephritis can have significant effects on pregnancy outcomes and requires careful management. Patients should receive preconception counseling and preparation to optimize their chances of a successful pregnancy. Management of lupus nephritis in pregnancy involves a multidisciplinary approach with close monitoring of maternal and fetal well-being. Kidney biopsy can be considered during pregnancy when therapeutic decisions depend on a precise pathologic diagnosis and will change any management. All patients with SLE should remain on hydroxychloroquine during pregnancy unless contraindicated. Um, specific monitoring and treatment protocols are required in high-risk situations, such as presence of specific antibodies uh, of uh, antiphospholipid antibody and uh, anti-SSC and anti-SSB. Um, the risks of preeclampsia, fetal loss, prematurity, IUGR uh, should be discussed with the patient and closely be monitored uh, for neonatal lupus, um, uh, including complete heart block. Uh, safe treatment options exist and should be appropriately used for disease activity during pregnancy. With this, I am in my talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Duval. I like picture at the end. And I think um, I was gonna say, I'm sure that Dr. Rora appreciates the teaser slide for Neff Madness is coming up. Um, any questions for Dr. Duval? Uh, hey, I, I actually have two questions. Um, the first one is, how soon after pregnancy do you uh, usually think of doing a biopsy, um, you know, and what kind of helps govern uh, how long you wait? Then the second one is, um, what level of severity do you usually consider before you you go as extreme as, as recommending, uh, you know, like an abortion and cyclophosphamide or, or something like that, um, if you, you would do that at all? Um, for the first question, I think 
in the case that I saw, we gave her enough time, I would say at least uh, a month, because uh, we were just considered that doing a biopsy early might uh, might might cause some results that uh, that might incline towards more like preeclampsia. We might see more preeclampsia preeclamptic changes on the biopsy and may not see like lupus. Uh, but we were just waiting for the patient to get uh, better, which she already did post delivery, and she was considered safe even safe even immediately after delivery um, with her uh, improvement in blood pressure and improvement in her symptoms. So she was kind of ready to go for a biopsy within a week, I would say. Um, but we just waited a bit longer. Um, in terms of the second question, I do not have a lot of experience. Um, this was the only case that I saw, um, but um, when I was talking to Ashley, um, he did, I think he did mention about using cyclophosphamide during uh, third trimester and did not see any adverse effects. I wouldn't say I encourage it. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it's a kind of last ditch option, but but it has been used. But we try and we try and avoid it even in the third trimester. Probably doesn't need to be said that um, you know, given current threats to um, op options for abortion care, all the more reason for us to understand this physiology and be able to counsel people, emphasize contraception, like you're saying, early. So yeah. I appreciate that. I think Lauren uh, did a recent talk on that um, as well, and uh, counseling patients, uh, 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 counseling patients on contraception, especially with the ongoing um, law. Absolutely, thank you.